Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight. Four months later, government receives $1.5 billion in Hurricane Dorian pledges. A father of three murdered overnight. The national security minister says he has no beef with the commissioner of police. Plus, a $600,000 contract signed for police body camps. News is brought to you by Alive. Welcome to Our News and thanks for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. One day after government received $1.5 billion in pledges to help with recovery efforts in the wake of Hurricane Dorian, it turns out more than half of that will have to be repaid by the government within 30 years. Our News sat down with the president of the company responsible for the largest chunk of that pledge. And I think it's important to know, for the Bahamian citizens to know that there are people all around the world rooting for you, rooting for you to make a strong comeback. The $1.5 billion pledge of money and services comes as residents of those two storm-ravaged islands struggle to rebuild four months after the killer storm left utter destruction in its path. During a news conference sponsored by the United Nations Development Program, companies from all over the world came together for the pledge worth nearly half of the over $3.4 billion in estimated damage caused by Dorian. The P3 Group was one of the companies making a sizable pledge for $975 million. It will include $50 million for technical assistance, $100 million for renewable energy, $155 million for essential facilities, and $670 million for health care. But we would be looking for local Bahamian companies that have capacity to work on these magnitude of projects, and we would integrate them into our team, and they would be the ones actually constructing uh, the project with our financial uh, backing. But here's one aspect of this $975 million that must be explained. According to P3 Group President Dee Brown, the company's pledge of $975 million is more like a loan with government expected to pay the money back with interest that has yet to be worked out. The government can elect to go as long as 30 years on repayment. So it's really, from a budgetary standpoint, what they're comfortable with. So when you talk, but when you're talking about you know, essential services like hospitals and schools and things that you need to get online quickly, uh, you, you know, you, you want to be able to execute that, understand the budgetary constraints, and deliver the project, you know, quickly. While this pledge can't be considered a donation due to the fact that the government must eventually pay it back within 30 years, Brown said it's still a win-win for the Bahamian people. What would happen is the government would basically pledge the revenue from the project to repay the, uh, the debt. And what we would do is, is really give concessional interest rates. So our rates would be lower than what you typically would see in the market. And also, we don't require the government to pledge their credit uh, behind the obligation. Therefore, it doesn't count against the national debt. Well, as government touts its ability to secure $1.5 billion in pledges, opposition leader Philip Davis is calling on the prime minister to clearly state what amount of that money has to be repaid by taxpayers and what amount was actually donated. Berthony McDermott has that. Davis was frank in his comments as he called Monday's pledge conference a PR stunt and questioned why the government waited four months after Dorian to hold such an event. The government said that, the minister said it. And as you know, it's, uh, his, he and the truth are strangers. And so we ought to look at the details. Four months after Dorian devastated Abaco and Grand Bahama, government announced it had received $1.5 billion in donor pledges for Hurricane Dorian relief during a conference held at Bahamar. However, the opposition leader slammed the $975 million pledge by the P3 Group, which represents nearly two-thirds of the $1.5 billion pledge to be used for social infrastructure. Davis pointed out it is not really a donation. First of all, if, if it is a loan, it is not a donation because we have to pay it back, right? When you speak about donation, we're talking with grants, we're talking with aid and assistance. I mean, what, under what conditions are the funds amounting to 900 and plus million, uh, what conditions are, which, are we borrowing those? We have to pay it back. 
So it can't be a donation. He called on the Prime Minister to clearly state what amount of those funds are donations and what has to be repaid by Bohemian taxpayers. I'd ask him to identify the donors, identify the conditions on which donations are being made. We need to separate what is being borrowed from what is being donated and then we'll understand what the true import of what the exercise yesterday produced. Davis added that the donor pledge conference was too little too late and insisted that the government is now competing for assistance with other countries around the world that are now facing natural disasters. You're now competing in the world market for aid when we just had the ravages of fires in, in Australia, you had the, the um, volcano, volcano uh, in the Philippines, you have the earthquake in Puerto Rico. Those are competing events for what I call donor funds in the international community. Reporting for our news, I'm Berthony McDermott. In other news, a father of three was gunned down near a shanty town off Carmichael Road just last night. Jared Higgs reports. Felipe Francois was quickly whisked away by officers as he took one last drink to remember his brother, who lay dead on a gurney awaiting transport. Police say 36-year-old Jacqueline Francois was gunned down on Montgomery Avenue off Carmichael Road at around 7 p.m. The scene of the killing just feet away from a shanty town. The victim, along with others, was standing um, on the side of the street when the occupants of a black Toyota Paso pulled through the corner, uh, opened fire in the direction of the man hitting the victim. Police markers show at least 10 spent bullets. Police press liaison officer Superintendent Chantanol says only the victim was hit. Of course, paramedics were called here to the scene and he was pronounced deceased. Francois's distraught brother says he leaves behind two girls and one boy, his youngest child, just two years old. The grieving brother says the victim worked as a mechanic construction worker, and whatever else he had to do to support his family. He says he wishes he was at the scene before the incident happened so he could encourage his brother to go home to the other side of the shantytown. According to our news records, Francois' killing is the fourth homicide for 2020. I'm saying if you know that there is uh, trouble brewing in your community, reach out to someone who can intervene and help us to save, possibly save the lives of our young men. Reporting for our news. I'm Jared Higgs. A woman was sexually assaulted at a home on Marshall Road this morning after police say two men forced their way into the family's home. According to the police report, the men broke into the home around 3 a.m. and robbed the residents of cash and personal items. One of the men then assaulted an adult female before the men escaped in a 2014 black Ford F-150 truck belonging to one of the victims. As police investigate this latest incident, Commissioner of Police Anthony Ferguson dismissed the suggestion that this category of crime is underreported by police. No, I don't have any concerns about the facts of under-reporting. Under um, you know, I think people have got to respect people's profession and stop um, speculating as to whether or not there's some underhand work. Police reported a 33% decrease in rape in 2019 and a 14% decrease in unlawful sexual intercourse. Ferguson expressed confidence that police officers are doing their job in investigating and reporting these incidents. There's no underhand, there's no reason for under-reporting. If something happened, I expect the officers who attended these scenes to make the accurate report, and I have every confidence that they are doing so. Amid public outrage over excessive force used by some police officers, the government signed a $600,000 contract for the introduction of body and dash cameras for the Royal Bahamas Police Force. Minister of National Security Marvin Dames called it an historic day for law enforcement. This signing today will transform policing as we know it in the Bahamas. And it will bring about that transparency that we have always promised that we would. Dame says he believes the use of body cams will reduce the number of complaints of police brutality and improve professionalism on the force. AE Tactical, a firm based in Trinidad and Tobago, will provide 200 acts on body cameras. Managing Director Luke Hadid says the contract is one of the biggest in the region. It is one of the largest deployments of uh, body-worn cameras anywhere within this region presently. And it's a massive step for the Royal Bahamas Police Force, and by extension the Ministry of National Security, in embarking on this program. Dame says the government is also considering acquiring tasers during the next fiscal year as a safer option for subduing suspects. Well, there is no bad blood between Commissioner of Police Anthony Ferguson and National Security Minister Marvin Dames, who denied media reports that he told Ferguson his days as the top cop are numbered. Jasmine Brown reports. 
The National Security Minister defended his relationship with the Commissioner of Police, insisting it's far from what's been reported in the press recently. During the ceremony to mark a contract signing for the integration of body cameras in the police force, a smiling dames took the podium and quickly pointed out that he and Commissioner of Police Anthony Ferguson do not have a strained relationship. Commissioner, you know you're my friend, right? Dames was responding to a story published in the Tribune newspaper on January 6th under the headline, Ferguson told, your days are numbered. According to the article, the National Security Minister was speaking at the police force annual church service when he indicated Commissioner Ferguson and his executive team should know by name the next generation of leaders. While on Tuesday, Dames was adamant that nowhere in his speech did he ever say anything about the commissioner's days being numbered. I went back to my speech to see if I can find uh, such a, a, a story, but never was able to do so. Dame says since the story was printed and became widespread public fodder, he and the police commissioner have had a chuckle over the fact that people now believe the two are butting heads. He said nothing could be further from the truth. It is interesting that it made one of the talk shows and everyone said, Mr. Dame ought not be doing that. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the press, Commissioner and I have no beef. I too was once a police officer in the Royal Bahamas Police Force. I have the utmost respect for the commissioner and his leadership team, and I would ask that the press retract that story. Thank you so much. In a show of solidarity, Dames requested that the commissioner be at the table for the signing of the body camera contract. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. All right, thanks, Jasmine. Still to come, will government seek compensation from Carnival Cruise Lines? Plus, what will happen when the Defense Force Commodore returns to work tomorrow? Stay tuned. Phone is good. Internet is good. TV is good. But why just pick one thing when you can have everything with Tria? Only $99 a month gets you phone, internet, and cable. That's everything you need for $99 a month. Ask for Trio. Call 601-2200 or email residential sales at cablebahamas.com. Rev, you and us together. In light of media reports that Carnival Cruise Lines discharged 34 cubic meters of black water in Bahamian waters as it sailed from Half Moon Key in March 2019, Attorney General Carl Bethel asserted today the Bahamas government would be exploring all of its legal options as, as outlined in new environmental laws. Uh, I was surprised to see the story in the paper today. Um, and we will be having discussions, uh, firstly with the Bahamas Maritime Authority and subsequently with um, all of the uh, parties that may be involved and we will see where we can go from there but uh, certainly steps will be taken by the government uh, under the environmental protection laws that we have um, to seek um, recompense, compensation, the assessment of any damages, etc. Everything depends on the level of damages. Bethel said once his office goes over the ship's log and meets with the necessary stakeholders, the government will decide on the right course of action. He added that he is disappointed by this revelation. At the end of the day, we all share an interest in, a, in preserving the pristine environment of our country. That is something that is marketable by the cruise lines and marketable by the Bahamas and enjoyed by both the Bahamian people and the visitors to this country. So the protection of the integrity of our environment is of critical importance and will be dealt with with appropriate seriousness by the government. There is no set timeline for the completion of the long-awaited Dome City in Abaco, according to Disaster Preparedness Minister Iram Lewis, who also revealed that officials are having difficulty getting residents to leave the Farm Road shantytown. Georgia Bain reports. Minister of Disaster Preparedness, Management and Reconstruction Aram Lewis giving several updates on Abaco following the passage of Hurricane Dorian. Four months after Hurricane Dorian forced Abaco residents to evacuate the island, the Dome City meant to house hundreds of displaced families remains incomplete with no clear timeline for completion. Though the domes were airmarked for Spring City Abaco, officials say residents can purchase domes from the government and have them erected on their property as they prepare to rebuild. 
To date, the Disaster Preparedness Minister says only 40 domes have been erected. Going on site, um, there were some issues with respect to the water table, with respect to the, to the, to the level of the ground. So we had to just had to do some adjustments so that um, we, we could have been in a position where we have 250 installed, but in a substandard condition. So we backpedal a bit to ensure that once we do it, it's done properly. Lewis added that residents are unable to occupy the domes just yet. He could not say what the completion deadline is. Because it will be a phased approach. We will make an announcement soon um, as to who will be uh, moving in, into those or, um, uh, domes and when. Lewis was also asked about residents from the Farm Road Shantytown. He said little progress has been made in getting those residents to leave. We're making efforts to have that area clean. And, and to ensure that, that whatever is rebuilt there is done properly, if we are to rebuild there. Um, there will be some no-build zones declared, as, as was stated by the Director of Works yesterday, and we make that clear, and there will be some restrictive zones, um, because, of course, we, we have to um, see how we can minimize our exposure to risk. As for the Pigeon Pea and Mud Shanty Towns, Lewis said cleanup efforts are nearing completion. He said the government will make a decision on how to use the land. Pigeon Pea itself has been completely cleared. The mud is about um, 80 to 90 percent. Reporting for our news, I'm Georgie Obey. One day before he is scheduled to return to active duty from mandatory vacation leave, the fate of Royal Bahamas Defense Force Commodore Tellus Bethel remains unclear. When asked about Bethel's return, Minister of National Security Marvin Dames gave a vague response. We want to be respectful to all involved. And um, as, we, as we move each day, we will, we will certainly uh, keep, keep is, you appraised. But we want, to be re we want to be respectful to uh, the Commodore. We want to be respectful to other officers within our law enforcement agencies, as we should be. The Commodore was placed on leave from October 15, 2019 to January 15, 2020. In October, Dame said no one knows what's next for Bethel after he completes his leave. However, in December, Dame said the government had a plan for Bethel following his return. These agencies are bigger than any one individual. We, we all know that people take leave. Uh, we have to be respectful of that. I want to be respectful of the Commodore. Uh, he's not only um, a colleague, but he's also a friend. I want to be respectful to every other officer so within the Royal Bahamas Police tomorrow, Force, the Defense Force. The press release uh, the we Force. shall see. Still to come, police investigating a suspicious death. Stay tuned. Phone is good. Internet is good. TV is good. But why just pick one thing when you can have everything with Tria? Only $99 a month gets you phone, internet, and cable. That's everything you need for $99 a month. Ask for Tria. Call 601-2200 or email residential sales at cablebahamas.com. Rev, you and us together. Police say they don't suspect foul play in the discovery of a body near Paradise Island Bridge on Monday afternoon. Superintendent Shanton Olds. Shortly after 2 p.m., the body of a female had been discovered at the bridge. Of course, we are waiting an autopsy's report to determine the exact cause of death. Um, but if there is anyone in, the, in that immediate area who can give us information, we'd welcome that information also. It does not appear as if foul play is suspected at this time. Social media reports suggest that the body's discovery was the result of a homicide. However, Knowles says police aren't convinced as yet. We are not uh, classifying that as a homicide, as a murder, sorry. Um, we're asking anyone who may have information. But until we get uh, concrete information, we will be treating that as a uh, sudden, sudden death. And we will wait for an autopsy's report to determine the exact cause of her de the death. 